Uh, first, I want to thank in advance the people uh, who've uh, given me guidance on this. Um, uh, uh, Mark Anderson, Roger Stripmatter, Shelley Maycock, uh, Tom Renier, Bonner Miller Cutter, um, Jim Warren, Brian Wildenthal, and there are probably others, and I apologize if I've uh, 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 left your name off. So today we're going to talk about, sort of go through the sequence of uh, um, why there's a controversy, who might have written the plays, uh, legal issues, members of royalty, um, all really important people. But first, let's talk about me. <laughs> That's my high school graduation picture. See, that's, that's why he's a great leader. <laughs> you can tell, right? Okay, so the deal is 1961, Forest Hills High School, Queens, New York. Anybody else from Forest Hills High School, Queens, New York in here? Right over there, look at that. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thing was, I loved Shakespeare in, in high school. Um, and I thought the story of the author was the stupidest thing I had ever heard in my entire life. Here I was killing myself to study and learn and cross-check, and they said this guy who was illiterate, couldn't read, um, never went to school. That sounded good to me at the time. He wrote all these plays. He's world famous 400 years ago. He never dies. And I said, I don't believe that those scholars really know the story. I never think there was anybody else. I just said, this is baloney. I thought something stronger, but all right. So when I do these talks, and again, I'm not talking to you, but pretend this is you 10 or 20 years ago, and you don't know anything about it, but you're curious, you're interested. So let's take a look at the Elizabethan age. Population of London in 1600, what? 200,000 people. Nobles formed a small, restricted, but powerful world. And, whoops, sorry about that. And all of these names here show up in one way or another in the plays or associated with Oxford. These are some of the issues at the time. It was illegal to be a Catholic. There are severe risks in criticizing the queen, the head of the Church of England. There were religious wars with France, Spain, and the lowlands. The monarch was unmarried and without an heir. There were spies everywhere. It was in many ways a police state. I gotta tell you, I've done this a number of times. I got other things coming up. This is the kind of thing that really gets to people. A police state? What happened to good Queen Bess, as, uh, as uh, Mark Anderson once called her? <laughs> well, I don't know either. Uh, um, during this time in, Elizabeth, in, in Elizabeth's world, the Pope declared her illegitimate. 10,000 French Huguenots were massacred. Covert Catholic uh, missionaries were sneaking into England. Mary, Queen of Scots, was arrested and eventually executed. The Queen did not tolerate dissent. As you may know, this is uh, an image, not exactly a photograph, but of uh, John Stubbs, who was a pamphleteer. He opposed Elizabeth's marriage, pending marriage, or possible marriage, with the Duke d'Anjou, the Catholic brother of the King of France. He published his, um, uh, his objections in 1579. Um, and he said the queen was too old. Really a bad mistake to make with a monarch who kind of ruled the police state. Really not, not to be done. And for his objections, he had his hand cut off. I point out to you that that's an ax, that's a hand, and eventually the hand goes over here. Um, uh, reports at the time said that as the ax was falling, he said, God save the queen. He should have said, God save my right hand. But If you were alive then, if you were literate then, if you were engaged in any member of the aristocracy, you knew about this. And it frightened you. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> talk about burying the lead. Uh, <laughs> Titus Andronicus was written at about the same time. 
The chopping took place in 1579. Titus is dated to 1579. Stubbs was a relative by marriage of someone we will meet later. Well, what do we know about William Shakespeare, Shakespeare, the traditional author? Nothing. Uh, he was born in 1564, his parents were illiterate, his children were illiterate, no record of schooling, no record of travel outside of England where authorization was needed, it was expensive, it was dangerous. No manuscripts, like, you know all this. Nothing was ever found tying him into his ability to write if he actually had one. He married at 18, his wife is 26. He moves to London without her or their eventual three kids. He's never identified as a writer. And what fascinated me when I finally figured it out was he never identifies himself as a writer. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say I'm a doctor, a lawyer, I'm a baker? And he dies without public notice in 1616. So how was he identified in his lifetime? He was identified as an actor. The College of Arms identified him as a player when it awarded a coat of arms, which had been actually rejected a few years uh, uh, early, excuse me, uh, earlier. He was identified as a property owner, a grain merchant, a money lender in Stratford at the end of his life. Um, let me pause for a commercial announcement here. Uh, this is the uh, coat of arms that was finally uh, uh, issued. Um, and this is, uh, this was a big deal a couple of years ago, if you recall. Um, uh, somebody at the Folger discovered the, the original outline for what became his coat of arms. Um, and it says here, Shakespeare, the player. Not the writer, not the playwright, not the poet. The player, actor, okay? It is only one of the great Shakespeare scholars of our era, uh, James Shapiro, who said in the uh, Washington Post, well, if you put everything we know about Shakespeare together with the fact that he was a player, it proves he wrote the plays. I don't get that either. <laughs> because, and I think it was Tom Renier pointed this out, this was an eyewitness. This was somebody who was there. This was the county clerk or the, the herald, whatever the title was. He was a player. What did he look like? Now, you've seen uh, in Bonner's presentation a little while ago, you, you saw the, um, uh, the permutations uh, of, of the image of Shakespeare. But remember, you're playing a game right now that you don't know anything. So just bear with me as I walk through this. It's one of my favorite uh, pictures. It has the <laughs> really terrific um, uh, sort of hun hunched over look. This was made 20 years after his death, presumably by people who, uh, who knew him best. <laughs> Friends like that. Uh, <laughs> This was uh, 30, uh, 1636, um, and I know that a lot of you who have written, um, whether you use a typewriter or not, uh, probably write on a sack of sheep's wool. I, I, I do that all the time. Uh, and about 100 years later, uh, the sheep have gone elsewhere, and we're riding on a pillow, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah, it's like you're staying at a Four Seasons resort. Uh, here, have a quill pen and a pillow, and uh, let's see what happens. Um, and then here's our pudgy friend um, uh, a bit later in, in, in Stratford. So we don't have original works, pages, notes, or manuscripts, but we do have his signatures, which you all know about. Now, the best thing you can say, the best thing I can say, is that um, 
he either was uh, uh, couldn't write, or maybe sadly at the end of his life he had some kind of arthritis or palsy or something. We don't know. We don't. Uh, the, these are signatures taken from his legal documents. Today, to make Shakespeare equal Shakespeare, you have to use certain kinds of language um, regarding him. Uh, you have to say, oh, could, should, would, must have, probably. You can almost see him. He's a native genius. He didn't need to read books. And my favorite, you don't need to travel. There was a bar where travelers went. <laughs> I'm looking for that bar. <laughs> now, the question is who could have written the plays? And I called on one of the great scholars of our age, Gidget, to, to ask the question. Those of us of a certain age have heard of her. I suspect the younger people have not. And so I need to consult with people under 25 uh, as to who I can substitute in here. So here are some candidates, Marlowe, William Stanley, uh, Bacon, the Queen, who could uh, read and write six, eight languages, including Greek, Greek and Latin. Uh, Emilia Bassano Lanier, this is what we call in journalism an added starter. Uh, I'd kind of heard of her, but not really, until that marvelous article in The Atlantic a couple of months ago, um, where she touches a number of bases. Uh, she probably traveled to Italy, but she definitely spoke it because her father did. He was a, an instrument maker. She was a published poet, apparently published the first book uh, by a woman in England, um, and uh, 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 so she's a potential candidate. Who could have written their plays? There have been doubts about who authored the plays for years before his death, um, and Brian is is about to publish uh, a book that's going to absolutely make that clear. Um, has published. Good. Um, but no one had ever systematically developed a way to investigate this question. Remember, you are all interested people. You are not the experts who are in the room attending this conference. So that brings us to the 20th century, to the mi earlier mid-19-teens. The man is a British secondary preschool teacher. His name is Jay Looney, and here he is. <laughs> He's actually the center for the Dallas Cowboys, and I defy anyone in this room to make fun of the way his name is pronounced. <laughs> Our guy is John Thomas Looney. Looney, an ancient name in the Isle of Manx teaches English. He's always been bothered by the lack of a reasonable biography for Shakespeare. He develops a method. He rereads all the works. He asks himself what the characteris characteris characteristics the author must have had, including education, knowledge, history, language skills, etc. He deduces that the author must have been a nobleman, supporter of monarchy, lover of sports, including falconry, which I believe was legal only for royalty to participate in. Uh, Well-educated multilingual, a loner. He uses Venus and Adonis, which we've heard a lot about on this conference, uh, 1593, the first heir of my invention, uh, as his guide. His second, the second thing about his method is that uh, he can't believe, no kidding, that so polished a work was the eff first effort of a poet. He looks at Palgrave's Golden Treasury of English Songs and Lyrics uh, to find minor writers, that is to say, people who could write but weren't well known. He compares the number of lines, rhyming schemes of Venus and Adonis with Palgrave's entries. He finds one poem called Women, which begins, if women could be fair and yet not fond, or that their love were firm, not fickle, still. The poem was by Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, the only poem by de Vere in Palgrave. Talk about finding an historic needle in a haystack. He goes to the Dictionary of National Biography for more information on the family and the man if possible, and he learns that, in fact, 
He was highly educated spendthrift. I'm growing increasingly unsure that I like that phrase, spendthrift. I think that could be kind of part of the uh, anti-Oxfordian lines, but this is a learning process for me too. Uh, Looney believes there's a match. And here's the guy. This is, these are only two of his uh, titles, Lord Great Chamberlain, uh, Viscount Bolbeck. His research lasts for four or five years, and in 1920, he publishes a book, Shakespeare Identified. Um, 100 years later, uh, the centenary, centenary edition by uh, our Jim Warren comes out, and in his introduction, he says, he writes, it remains the most revolutionary book on Shakespeare ever written. Why? Why is the book revolutionary? Because Looney didn't set out to prove anything. He set out to follow the evidence. Hello? Because it is fact-based. Because it connects the works with a real person's life. And suddenly, if you connect the works with a real person's life, and you connect the life with the works, you start to say, oh, wait a minute. He's not the only person in the history of literature and civilization who has no connection to his works. What? No, of course he has a connection to his works. De Vere, as an author, is connected to the works, and we can see that as we go through. So what do we know about Oxford? Uh, 1550, his father is John the 16th Earl. His mother is Lady Marjorie. Uh, his lineage can be traced back to the Norman Conquest. His father sponsored a troop of actors, the Earl of Oxford's men. He's brilliant, quite hot-headed. Again, I'm not sure about that. Maybe that's part of the anti-Oxfordian uh, propaganda. He's an excellent horseman, extravagant. Again, I'm not sure about that. I'm putting this in because it's the standard biography. Uh, as a ward, a minor, his properties are sold by his guardian. As an adult, he often sells estates to raise cash. And I'm wondering increasingly whether he sells the estates to raise cash for the production of plays, not simply to pay off gambling debts or whatever. Again, for me, this is a gray area. He dies at the age of 54 in 1604. Uh, his father had died at the age, I wonder if I skipped something. Hang on a second. No, I just skipped the blank page. His father died at the age of 43 when Oxford was 12. That would be a key age. Retrospectively, the possibility of poisoning is raised. Why? We know of anybody else poisoned? OK. So maybe. Who knows? Um, he's made a ward of the crown. Uh, Elizabeth becomes his legal mother. Cecil becomes his guardian. 12 years old, he leads. I wish I had an image of this. Uh, apparently, Roger tells me I can find it somewhere. But he leads a troop of 140 mounted retainers dressed all in black, riding two by two from Headingham Castle to Cecil House in London, 65 miles away. Cecil House has a library of 1,700 books. I would like to get from you the, uh, that graphic of the books in this. I, I just, I was so stunned by that. Thank you. Um, that's the keep at Headingham. Um, there's some jousting going on, and there's you can rent for your wedding or your divorce if that's what you want to do. <laughs> and this is William Cecil. Uh, and and anybody who's been to North Carolina to see the Biltmore uh, estate will sort of recognize the same arch modest architectural uh, <laughs> style. <laughs> and. And there is a painting of William Cecil right in the front of the bedroom area. I nearly fell over. Well, uh, my wife and I were down there on a vacation a couple of years ago. There's the guy. All right, so what do we know about Cecil? Most powerful advisor to the queen. You know this stuff. Secretary of State. Um, uh, a historian says for nearly 40 years, the biography of Cecil, and that's really the Cecil family, uh, is indistinguishable from that of Elizabeth in the history of England. Ruthless and smart, and, uh, and, but a yeoman cannot marry into the nobility. This will play a role later on. 
Robert Cecil is his son, takes over from dad. Um, scoliosis, hunchback. Uh, Queen Elizabeth calls him my pygmy, ridiculed in Richard III. Maybe didn't particularly like Oxford because of it. Let's take a look at his education for the moment. I'm going to kind of rush through this. From the age of 5 to 12, when his dad dies, uh, he is tutored by Sir Thomas Smith, uh, uh, one of the two greatest uh, linguists in England, uh, and the owner of 400 books in Greek, Latin, and English. Tutoring takes place at Headingham and Anchorwick uh, near Windsor. His second tutor uh, at Cecil House uh, is Lawrence Noel, scholar and founder of Anglo-Saxon studies. The most famous work in Anglo-Saxon literature is Beowulf. I know you've all read it in the original. <laughs> One day, while tutoring Oxford, a package arrives, the world's only copy of Beowulf. Beowulf will not be re reprinted for another 100 years. Noel receives the package. I'm sure it was the Amazon delivery service of the day receives it, signs it, and dates it. Stratfordians say echoes of Beowulf can be seen in Hamlet, but they <laughs> it wasn't translated. It wasn't reprinted for another 100 years. So you either had to go into um, uh, Noel's house and steal it or read it, or you had to somehow invent a book one, only one copy of which existed. How did that happen? Genius, that's the answer. Unbelievable. Now, I'm calling this De Vere's classical education. It was actually mine. Uh, dancing at 7 to 7.30 in the morning, breakfast, French, Latin, writing and drawing, common prayers, midday meal, cosmography, Latin, French, and exercises with his pen. Exercises with his pen. Now, if I'd been really mean, but as you know, I'm not a mean guy, I would have run this handwriting sample right next to the five signatures we have to show you what re writers really had in those days. Third teacher, he's now about 15, is his uncle, his mother's brother, who's then engaged in translating Ovid's Metamorphosis into English for the first time. Golden, Golding is a Puritan. The metamorphosis can get pretty racy. Did 15-year-old Oxford help in the translation and kind of maybe juice it up a bit? I don't know. 1564, he gets a bachelor's degree from Cambridge, a master's from Oxford. He enrolls at Gray's Inn for legal studies. There's Gray's Inn. Looks a lot like your school, doesn't it? Why would England's hereditary Lord Grey Chamberlain study law? The aristocracy was expected to be judges against crimes against the state, with the treason trials of Mary Queen of Scots, Norfolk, Essex. Oxford himself, as a landlord, owned lots of, uh, uh, of estates, and he needed uh, to adjudicate disputes on his estates. Um, and indeed, uh, there were lots of other uh, well-known writers who were from an aristocratic background who went to Gray's Inn. Uh, but <laughs> let's deal with the question of whether education matters. Um, I believe the number of the creation of 1,700 or more words uh, in Shakespeare, for, are seen in Shakespeare for the first time in English. There are more doublets in, Engl in the English translation of Ovid um, than in the original uh, Ovid. Um, uh, in, uh, strike that in the original uh, Latin. Uh, this is Richard Wagaman's work. I'm not sure if he's presented at this conference, but I know he's published on it. Uh, Hendiotesis, is that what it's called? Hendiotesis, Hendi yeah. Uh, legal language throughout the work. Summer's lease hath all too short a date. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and let's ask whether Oxford published anything under his own name. Letters often asking for money or business concessions. Introductions in English and Latin to the works of others. 20, more than 26 published poems. 
who taught thee first to sigh, alas, my heart, who taught thy tongue the woeful words of plaint, who filled your eyes with tears of bitter smart, who gave thee grief and made thy joys to faint. Hard evidence. Roger Stripmatter's original research. The second edition of the Geneva Bible, printed in 1569-70, purchased for Oxford, uh, along with a Chaucer and a Plutarch. Uh, Stratfordians, our friends the Stratfordians regard it as the Bible most familiar to Shakespeare, and it's at the Folger. There's a, a picture of Roger, I, I hand drew that. Uh, <laughs> there are 1,000 marked passages, 300 marked Bible passages uh, are reflected in the Shakespeare works, and 2001, Roger got his PhD uh, on the Bible. And there's the Bible. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but as you may know, that's the boar, B-O-A-R. Um, and, oh, well, this doesn't really come out good. The key word here is naughty and crooked nation, uh, which appears in the Bible, and we don't have to go very far to have Portia say, how far this little candle throws his beam, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. And I forgot to turn my watch on. <laughs> so you'll be late for lunch. 15 minutes? Uh, so let me turn it on now, and then I'll, I'll know. OK. Uh, so Cecil gets elevated to the peerage in 1571, which amazingly em enables his daughter to marry Oxford. Uh, Anne is 15, Edward, Edward is 21. Um, here are some interesting, <laughs> what you would call fun facts. The now married Oxford is rumored to be the queen's lover. Uh, in 73, Oxford's men assault Burley's men on the road to Rochester, uh, which we can read about in the first part of Henry IV. Oxford goes to the lowlands without permission of the queen and is ordered back. You do not mess around with the queen and her orders. He does get permission uh, to go from uh, England uh, down to uh, Italy, stopping off in France uh, to attend the marriage of this guy. Um, and a question has been raised, was he doing it was he, pr uh, was he given permission to travel if he spied on uh, goings-on in France or, um, or the king? Then on to Italy, where he stays in this Motel 6 type place, <laughs> the Doge's Palace in Venice. Um, we know there are 13 plays set in Italy. And the stupidest thing you can ever imagine are the Stratfordians saying, well, in that bar, the Hawk and Dove, or whatever it was called, uh, um, uh, he heard people talking about the different streets. You know, I don't know about you, but the last time I spent a lot of time in a bar, streets, street addresses were not what I was really focusing on. <laughs> but call me crazy. Goes to Titian's studio. Now, you got to remember, few people had access to these locations. There was not a, an, an e-ride ticket you could buy to these locations in, in, uh, in Venice. Um, this is a close-up of uh, Adonis. Um, and if you notice, he has a beautiful head of hair. But nothing else on his head. In Venus and Adonis, we read, he sees her coming, begins to glow, and with his bonnet hides his angry brow. There's the bonnet. That picture has never left Titian's studio. There were all kinds of reproductions done by the school of Titian, but only one with a bonnet. You had to be there to see it. He goes 30 miles up the road to Mantua. He is mesmerized by the works of the sculptor and painter, Giulio Romano. Uh, and he's mentioned by name in the Winter's Tale, the only artist mentioned in the works. This is uh, uh, the room in the Palazzo del Te. Um, Hecuba, which we're gonna, the dream of Hecuba is here. 
It was installed there and it never left there. This is in Lucrece. The poem accurately describes her figure, the, uh, the cloth, and in the background you can see Tarquin looming ominously over her. Stratfordians have a real problem with this kind of information about Oxford. So frequent and thorough is Shakespeare's engagement with Italy in his plays that it has been suggested that he traveled to Italy sometime between the mid-1580s and the early 1590s. The so-called lost years when we have unreliable or no reliable information. No evidence to support this claim, but I'm a Stratfordian, so I'll make it anyway. <laughs> it's clear that Italy was the primary land of his imagination. Unlike other countries, such as France, Austria, Denmark, in which he sets particular plays, his representations of Italy are diverse and unusually precise. That is by a professor of modern English literature at University College, London. Merchant of Venice, set in Venice. You know the plot, Antonio O. Shylock, 3,000 ducats, repayable with money or a pound of flesh. The ships sink at sea. The judge says to Shylock, a pound of that same merchant's flesh is thine. The court awards it, and the law doth give it. Shylock can hardly believe his good luck. But then the judge says, take thou thy pound of flesh, but in the cutting of it, if it shed one drop of Christian blood, thy lands and goods are by the laws of Venice confiscate under the state of Venice. And Shylock says, is that the law? And the judge says, thyself shall see the law. Political affiliations aside, <laughs> you will recall that last year or the year before, the Merchant of Venice was put on in the ghetto in Venice for the first time. And Justice Ginsburg served as the judge. Isn't that cool? So Oxford's personal life can be kind of disdainful of public opinion. He hired a courtesan to accompany him while he was there. He brings a boy singer back from Venice to England. Now you could say, well, the courtesans in Venice, they weren't ladies of the evening, they were skilled, they were knowledgeable, they could read and write, they could perform on musical instruments, and this guy had a great voice. I can buy all that, I really can. But from the point of view of, shall we say, in modern political terms, optics, this looks really bad. His strained relations with his wife. His daughter is born while he's away. X number of uh, 17 years. This is, I, you know, with all the, uh, the Me Too movement, his wife denies infidelity. And I, I just started to wonder, was she raped and too ashamed to say? I mean, if that timing is accurate, and I, I don't know. Um, they separate for five years. He has a child out of wedlock with Dan Vavasour, one of the ladies, uh, Queen's ladies in waiting, all three are sent to the uh, tower. Um, and you have to wonder, would Burley, the most powerful man in England, have liked this treatment of his daughter? Uh, I mean, you know this. I still want to figure out, and I don't have, he's lost his good name, but the shock and shame of infamy. What was the infamy? I mean, I don't know, and I don't have an answer that satisfies me. But as I say, this is a work in progress. Um, his poems are published. Uh, the introductions are to the Earl of Southampton. Um, this gets pretty steamy, the second introduction of Lucrece. What I have done is yours, what I have to do is yours, being part in all I have, devoted yours. I suspect, if not from the Arundel family and others who wanted to slander him, this is the kind of thing that led Others to say he was bisexual, he was notorious. I have no idea. I'm just reporting. But the thing is, would a lad from the countryside have had the sheer stupidity to address a nobleman this high up 
in that emotional, passionate way? Don't you sort of get your tongue cut out? I mean, if you, I don't get it. Meanwhile, Elizabeth, without an heir, is sitting on a fragile throne. I've got to change that language. That's really not good. There's, there's no heir. She's rejecting suitors left and right. Marriage negotiations are falling apart. England is still threatened. She needs to unite her country against enemies domestic and foreign. She declares herself the virgin queen married only to England. Now we come to the 1,000 pound grant, which Bonner has so brilliantly elucidated both in an essay in her book and, and today. Um, Oxford gets 1,000 pounds, half a million to a million a year in today's money. It continues for 18 years. The funds never had to be paid back or accounted for. No purpose was ever stated. How come? We suddenly get a bunch of history plays. Um, and they all tend to support the Tudor dynasty. <laughs> what a coincidence. The De Vere line went back to William the Conqueror. It was England's oldest, uh, oldest family. The British plays are pro-monarch, anti-rebellion, pro-stability. The Stratfordians hate that line. They hate that line because it shows who would be pro-monarch, except maybe royalty. Who would be anti-rebellion? Because poor people, disempowered people, rebel. And after all, if Shakespeare was such a nice guy from the countryside, he might have rebelled too. Well, Justice John Paul Stevens, for one, whom, whose uh, 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 tribute uh, we heard from uh, Tom the other day, he believed that Oxford was hired to rewrite British history in favor of Elizabeth and the Tudor dynasty. Uh, Winston Churchill thought that Henry V was uh, such an inspirational play uh, and, a, and a great propaganda play uh, that he encouraged Laurence Olivier to, I believe, produce it, but definitely act in it. Richard II, uh, the abdication scene was never permitted to be performed in the Queen's lifetime. And she said, no, you not that I am Richard. Midsummer Night's Dream, he thought I was enamored of an ass. Really difficult thing now. If Titania is a stand-in for Elizabeth's infatuation with the Duke, who's an ass, again, you have to ask, OK, uh, would a commoner like Shakespeare have been permitted to mock the queen without losing his right hand? Hamlet. There are lots of parallels. We say they are autobiographical. Stratfordian says um, nonsense. Hamlet, Oxford, Polonius, Cecil, Ophelia, and Cecil, Laertes, Thomas, Cecil, Gertrude, Oxford's birth mother, or maybe the queen. Remember when his, uh, his father died and perhaps he was poisoned. Hamlet's father dies before the play starts. Oxfordians say Hamlet starts to take place in 1584. Burley's other son, Thomas, goes on diplomatic travels. Burley writes the precepts, certain precepts, out for him. You know them all by heart. And so, do they sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen? Polonius versus Burley. Burley, the real person, says, be not scurrilous in conversation or satirical in thy jests. Polonius, the character, says, Give thy thoughts, no tongue, nor any unproved act is thought. Be thou familiar, no means, by no means vulgar. I've got a couple of others in here. Uh, here we go. Uh, neither, neither borrow of a friend or of a neighbor, but a stranger, but of a stranger who's paying for it, thou shall hear no more of it. Polonius says, neither a borrower nor a lender be. You can see this. Um, now, Burley dies in 1598. The precepts were found at Burley's house um, in 1616, 18 years after his death. Oxford dies in 1604. Hamlet is printed in 1604. How would Shakespeare, will Shakespeare from Stratford, have cited a private manuscript 12 years before it was discovered? I'll be silent while you 
Think about that. Hmm? Those are all correct answers. I think I've got a minute and a half. Uh, you know about all this. Oh, Oxford. Oxford's, uh, uh, Oxford left England but never went to Denmark. But his brother-in-law did. He went to Denmark to Castle Elsinore where he met Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. I'm indebted to Tom Renier for this. Uh, this was the law case of Hales v. Pettit. Uh, this was actually an inheritance case. Um, if I'm standing by the water and the water comes up and drowns me, um, is it murder or is it suicide? It has to do, uh, if it's one or the other, it has to do whether my heirs can get my estate. Um, but what does it matter? It was written in Norman law French, another language I'm sure they talked all the time in Stratford. But Oxford went to the Inns of Court, to Gray's Inn. OK. Uh, that's the location of Fisher's Folly, where he could have had his uh, writing group. Uh, these are three examples of um, uh, theaters at the time where you can get a sense of sort of why the theater was so disrespectful uh, or was tr uh, uh, treated in such a disrespectful way. Here's an example of bear baiting. Uh, this is the globe, a reconstruction of the globe. Uh, this is at court, and I think it's important to remember that here are the actors up here, and here's the queen, and there's really not much space between them. So let's ask a few remaining questions. Why didn't Oxford identify himself? And if you're going to do this and take this to local groups uh, in your communities, this so far has been the most popular question I get asked. Why didn't he identify himself? Well, we can say there was risk. He commented through the plays on politics and personalities, even his father-in-law. The custom was nobles didn't do such things. They used pseudonyms. That seems to be very hard for an audience to grasp, uh, a, a modern audience. It was an age of disguised uh, uh, names. A uh, researcher at uh, Penn uh, has come up with 4,000 disguised names of authors and publications um, uh, up to 1640, and it doesn't include Mark Twain. The public stage was dis disreputable. We saw the bear baiting and the prostitution. Bad things happen to people who anger the queen. Oxford was the first cousin of John Stubbs' wife. You remember John Stubbs, who lost his writing hand? That was Oxford's cousin. That was his first cousin. You all have first cousins, right? Where are Oxford's papers? Another common question. We don't know. Um, I, I, I try and deal with the fact that given the bad relations between Burley and Oxford, um, uh, disappearing him would be a good way to start because most of the things were found in the manuscripts or papers of other people. How did he adopt the Shakespeare name? I'm not getting into that, because you've heard it a number of times. We know it's a big deal. Um, note the, the hyphen. In, in other words, it can be spelled lots of different ways. And significantly, there's nothing written in here where the author's name would normally go. I proposed once that Bob Myers go in there, but no, nobody bought it. Why does it matter? Because the Elizabethan age represents one of the greatest and most tumultuous moments in history. Understanding who wrote the era's greatest works and why they were written enriches, enriches history and all people. Because if I said to you that it doesn't matter, how Rembrandt studied light or Henry Ford developed his assembly line, you would throw me out. Truth matters. First folio in all of this, I'm going to go through it quickly, published in 1623. It included some but not all of the works. It was published without Shakespeare's crest. Really? What does that have to do with anything? But it was published with this jokey image of somebody. Even Ben Johnson says the image is a phony. Don't look on his image. Look on his book. <laughs> Why would I want to look at his image? 
Where had the plays been all these years? That's the first folio. And that's Mary Sidney Herbert. And she, the, she was the Countess of Pembroke. Her brother was Philip Sidney. She had two sons, the incomparable pair of brethren, William and Philip. William had been engaged to a noblewoman named Bridget. Philip was married to Bridget's sister, whose name was Susan. And Susan was the youngest daughter of Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. So what is keeping the truth from coming out? And we had a really wonderful session on this the other day. I don't know how that happened. Shakespeare is worth 325 pounds or $405 million a year uh, in England. Google took less than a second to tell me that there are 24 million books about Shakespeare. Shakespeare industry supports 11,000 local jobs in Stratford. Talk about an industry. These are the halls of academia. That's the library at Oxford University. That's uh, the library at Columbia. And tragically, that's Royce Hall at UCLA, where I graduated in 1965. And these are books that are essential, among many others, to understanding um, uh, the issue. And um, Roger, I, the next edition gets your the cover of your book in here on the poems. These are the folks who've made this possible. They help me. Uh, if there are any mistakes, it's mine. <laughs>